I'm Robin Vincent and I'm a music technology journalist. I write about uh, synthesizers, about software, about uh, computers, music technology, modular and how all those things work together. Today I am talking about getting started with modular, so the very, very, very beginning. I'm assuming uh, that you have an idea of synthesis or synthesizers to some degree, but I'm not really taking it any higher than that. So hopefully I'll be able to unpack uh, the terms that are used, some of the language that's used, and then we're going to get together and build a little, a little modular here and see how that sounds and see what that does. There's something about um, modular, there's something about wires and lights and buttons and beeps and noises that has brought you here, thinking that, yeah, there's something in that. I want some of this on my desk. I want some of this in my life. And so hopefully my intention this morning is to, is to give you a bit of an information dump, but also to, to look, to spend a little bit of time uh, plugging a few things in to see if they make sound. Hopefully by the end of this morning, I would have pushed you sort of from befuddlement into mild bewilderment and hopefully perhaps into a place where you can go, ah, oh, right, okay. Uh, I can, I can look at this differently because, I mean, wandering around Synthfest, as uh, you may have already done or you may have done in previous years, the modular side of it is very, it feels like you're, I don't know, it feels like it has a distortion field around it and you're shuffling around it. You're going, all right, oh, there's a synthesizer. Okay, I understand that. Then, oh, there's another little bit of modular. I'm going to step around there. Oh, another synthesizer. When actually what you need to do is that you need to lean in because with modular, it's not stuff that you can do from a distance. It's stuff that you have to get your hands in. You have to get dirty and commit yourself into moving into it and touching things. And everything here at Synthfest is there to be touched. And hopefully I can encourage you to touch things. So uh, to start with, we, I'm going to kick off with just uh, giving you a bunch of information, which I hope will be uh, useful to you. If at any point I speak a word which doesn't make any sense, by all means wave at me and uh, I'll try to unpack that a bit or I might just ignore it. It just you know, depends on how that goes. Um, so that, because there's a language, there's always a language when you're approaching a new form of something and that language is often impenetrable. I certainly found that on my Eurorack journey uh, to start with, I, I didn't know what anyone was talking about. And so I want to uh, get through that, hopefully. Um, and then after, after that, we'll start, as I say, we'll start plugging things in and we'll go from there. And at the end, we'll have uh, space, hopefully, for some questions and answers. And we'll just see how it goes. So I'm already wasting too much time. So let's, let's begin with uh, what is modular? So like I say, I want to start kind of at the bottom end. This may be simple for some of you, but for others, it might not be. So, modular, what is modular? Well, modular is essentially the taking out of all the component parts of a synthesizer and setting them on their own. It then allows you to, to build your own synthesizer from all these different parts, from all these different places, to create whatever kind of synthesizer you could possibly imagine. That could be a simple monosynth. It could be an effects processor. It could be a drum processor. It could be some kind of hybrid weirdness that also runs video and lights. Who knows? Whatever it is that you want to do can be done with modular, with the right bits and the right cache. You can put the whole thing together. So, of course, synthesizers come from modular. We're in this strange world where everything is going backwards and forwards all at the same time. So, synthesizers came out of modules, individual oscillators that make sound, individual filters that filter that sound, individual amplifiers that amplify that sound. And when people started building synthesizers, they brought those together because that was a heck of a lot easier than having to patch all this crazy stuff together. But now we're at the other side of that where it's a lot more interesting to patch all this crazy stuff together. And that's, and that's where we are. So modular is an individual, an individual module that often does one thing. Not always, there's modules that do lots of crazy stuff. But this, for instance, is an oscillator. It just oscillates, it creates a tone, it creates a sine wave and some other waves, and we use that as a noise that we enjoy and do things with. 
So that's an individual part. If this was in a synthesizer, you wouldn't get to see any of this. You wouldn't get to see these bits and pieces, and it would all be plugged in for you. But with modular, you plug it in yourself. You can decide how the audio goes from one place to another. Does it go through a filter? Does it go to something else? Does it go to some other form of shaping? Does it go to some other crazy place? Do you use that audio actually to modulate something else? So the possibilities of modular are essentially endless. In a synthesizer, a keyboard synthesizer, you know what I'm talking about when I say a synthesizer, yeah? Yeah? OK. Within that, it's kind of hardwired, and you have to follow the path that the manufacturer has provided for you. With this, you don't. You create the paths. And the interesting thing about this, as I've been thinking about this lecture, is that um, we, we tend to view our music as something that we express through instruments. We use instruments, we express, and that's our music. Whereas with modular, it becomes the building of the instrument itself is also how we express our creativity. So in putting together a patch, in patching together different modules, that in itself is a creative process. And that's very different to just taking someone else's instrument and playing something on it. So then what is Eurorack? Well, Eurorack, this is, I think, that's my, cur my current setup on there as I'm trying to pull things together to do this. Um, so Eurorack is kind of the, uh, the unruly baby brother of modular. Uh, there are different forms and formats of modular, things like Moog and Buchler, Roland maybe, Korg. Um, but uh, Eurorack is the one that has exploded in recent times because, well, for two important reasons. It's, it's a little bit smaller and it's a lot cheaper. And those two factors alone make it an interesting place to play. So it's all the same stuff. It's all the same sort of oscillators, same sort of filters, same sort of amplifiers. What Moog do is the same as what you do in Eurorack. It's just the word Eurorack purely describes the format. And so that format is really it's not defined by a great deal, but there's a couple of things that define it physically. And that is the height. The height is uh, 3U. So in pro audio terms, a 1U rack unit, for instance, uh, this is three of those high, so it fits into a, a rack unit nicely. Uh, that's my, my Tascam DA38. Um, the other dimension you have is called horizontal pitch or hole point, and that is the, the holes that they get screwed into uh, on here. And that defines a width which is so many millimeters wide. And so every, every module is defined by its width in HP. It doesn't matter if you call it horizontal pitch or whole point, nobody cares, it's just HP. So this is so many HP wide. And you will buy a case which has so many HP room in it. And so that's really all that defines Eurorack. There are things about voltages and bits and pieces. Oh, I mean, the other important thing is that it's patched together with uh, mini jacks. Uh, if you're using Moog modular, that'll be patched together with uh, quarter inch jack cables. Um, Surge and Buchler is banana plugs, uh, hilariously. But this is just uh, good old fashioned mini jacks, mono mini jacks. And this carries both audio and control voltage. What is control voltage? Well, control voltage is a, it's a signal, it's an audio signal. It's a waveform in electrical form. So down a cable, if you, uh, if you wobble a cable at one end, it sends a sine wave down to the other. Well, I mean, if you do it electronically, as opposed to like this, right? <laughs> and those sine waves can either be heard if they're, if they're fast enough, so if they're above 10, 20 hertz or 50 hertz, probably for me, I imagine. Uh, it starts to get audible. But anything below that, it's just a moving sine wave or other wave that you can't hear, but we can use that as a control voltage over other things. Now, you may be familiar with MIDI, where you map a knob to a MIDI parameter and you can move that. That's fine. Control voltage does a similar thing, but it does it in kind of a, an infinite space as opposed to a, a small number of values. So because it's voltage, it goes up and down, and it can be any value you like. It just keeps on going infinitely. 
And the interesting thing about control voltage is that you mix it together like you mix together audio signals. So you use a controlled voltage to change, for instance, the sweep on a filter. And that, if you apply a sine wave to a filter sweep, you get that type filter sound uh, that we're all familiar with. Um, and that's one way of using a voltage to control a parameter. You can also use it to control pitch. So rather than sending a wave, you're sending a set voltage which defines, in some way, some kind of pitch. What that actual pitch is doesn't matter. It's not important. You're just applying a set voltage which is controlling a set thing in your module. So with control voltage, where it starts to get interesting is where you can blend and mix these things together. So you may have a sine wave on your filter, but you can apply another sine wave to that to make that get bigger and smaller as it goes. And then you can apply another voltage to that to move that around or to change it or to turn it off and to turn it on. The possibilities of control voltage are extraordinary. And it's that which I think has really opened it up for me because rather than deliberately applying uh, an automation track to something, I want to control the filter, I draw in automation in my door, or I, can tr or I record it on a knob, on a MIDI knob, I can now take that sort of movement and I can feed it into other bits of movement that create a new bit of movement that I can then inject in some other piece of movement, which then finally starts attacking the filter I was, or the parameter I was trying to move. And you can create and discover and explore just by putting these things together. Because you can't break anything. Nothing is going to go wrong. You just keep on sticking stuff together and seeing where it ends up. And then because it's, you're not trying to map anything, you're just plugging stuff in. So I can take this extraordinary waveform coming out of here, and I'll plug it in there. Oh, that sounds terrible. I'll plug it in here. Oh, that's a bit more interesting. I'll plug it in there. You just keep on plugging until something interesting occurs. And this is the way that, that modular works, that it's, it's infinitely variable and changeable and experimental and adventurous. And so you can go on a journey every time you sit, on, sit down with it, which is something that I don't think a, a software synth has ever really given me. The reality of control voltage is that we use it in three ways normally. We use it for modulation. So modulation is the word we use when we're changing something. So we're using this waveform, however that waveform is created. It could be a sine wave, it could be an up and down wave. We're using that and we're changing a parameter. That's modulation. Uh, we then have triggers. Triggers is when you just, you're slapping something. You could be triggering a pulse, you could be triggering a drum sound, you could be triggering an envelope. Um, we use triggers that are just bursts of voltage. And then there's a gate. Gate is like a trigger, but it has a length. So it holds something open and then lets it close. So that's commonly used on, say, a melody where you're having individual notes which can be different lengths because of the gate length and how long that's been, that door for that sound to come through is being held open. Now, uh, Eurorack, modular, whatever it is, I use the term um, uh, in, either, in either sense, uh, is a very frustrating thing to start because the hardest thing is the first thing you have to do. Uh, modules, they're great. I mean, I, you know, I want a filter. Buy a filter. Great, got a filter. Uh, but the thing is, you're going to need something to put it in, and you're going to need to power it. And it's those two things which are the biggest barrier to entry. It drove me nuts. I mean, I've, been, I've only been into modular for about three, four years. And when I started, um, I mean, it's, yeah, the place is completely different now. Well, no, not really. But back then, in those days, uh, cases and power supplies were talked about as, as DIY projects. And there is um, a huge element of, of do-it-yourself in Eurorack, and that's fine, and that's exciting, but it doesn't have to be that way. And thankfully, these days, it's not anywhere near as difficult. But this is the first hurdle that you have to get to. You have to decide on a case, you have to decide on a power supply. Hmm. So, let's talk about that for a minute. Cases. Now, you can get cases in all sorts of sizes and shapes, uh, huge ones, uh, small ones, little piddly ones, uh, all those sorts of things. Uh, the one I've got here uh, is a, look, it says, it says Moog. 
on it, which is quite good. This, I think, costs about 120 quid. There's now a Behringer one, which is exactly the same without this uh, for about 70. So um, actually, that's a, that's a point. I, I, I thought we might try this as a bit of an experiment as we go, is to price it up because price is one of those things that we don't like to talk about. So I want to talk about it. And so as we go along, I will ask uh, people here, I'm assuming you have some kind of device on you, that if you could find out prices of stuff as we go, and then at the end of the talk, we can find out how much all this has cost. <laughs> so uh, this is what, 70 quid, did I say if you cut the Behringer one? Oh, so I'll stick that down. 70 quid for the case. Now, the, um, what was I talking about? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, cases, different cases, big cases, small cases. Now, you essentially have to make a decision as to how far am I going to take this? Am I just farting around with a couple of little bits to a, to a larger setup? Am I going to go in full force? And uh, I've, I've, you know, I've converted my garage into a, into a, a place, a cathedral of modular. You have to make a decision early on as to what that's going to be. Now, the great thing about this particular case, because um, this is one of the few really great decisions I made in my journey, is that you can buy brackets for it, so you can stack three up together, making a much larger system. So you can start by filling up this, which is 104 HP. You could fill that up, and then you can build, buy another one, stack that up, and another one, and so on. It only goes three high, unfortunately. It would be nice if it went further now, but I just get another one and another one. But you do have to make this decision at the beginning, and that's that's very frustrating. But huh, what can you do? So there's lovely ones you can get from the suitcase types or wooden edged ones. Uh, the one in the middle, I think, is called the Happy Ending Kit from Tip Top Audio, and that's probably the cheapest. Um, off the shelf way in. That's about 80 quid, I think, and I think that's right. Maybe someone could look it up and confirm that with me. Uh, the Tip Top Happy Ending Kit, but it also comes with the power supply, which is the next thing we have to talk about. So think about cases. Think about, am I likely to push this further? Do I want to get something temporarily, which I'll then sell on? It's a decision that only you can make, because only you can decide how far you're going to push this thing. So then talking about power supplies, um, when I was first looking into this, everyone was talking about how to build it, how to, to, to put it together, the sort of bus boards to use. You have to go and measure the voltages and how much ampage everything is taking, and it's just like, oh, I, don't, I don't even know where to begin. C because people would say to you, you know, you'd ask the question on a forum, oh, yeah, what sort of power supply do I need? Don't hurt me. And they would say, oh, well, it depends on what modules you have. Well, I don't have any modules yet. Well, then how do you know what power supply you want? I don't know, because I can't buy a module because I don't have a power supply. Yeah, but then what modules do you want? I don't know. And you would go in this cyclic argument. So my advice is just buy an off-the-shelf one. Don't worry about uh, ampage. If you are building a wall of modular, you have to worry about ampage. If you're building a couple of rows, a suitcase full that we had on the previous slide, then one power supply unit like this fella here, oh, threaded nuts, I mean the other one, um, this is a 4MS row power 40, this will power at least a couple of rows, at least. So there's no problem. And if there is, buy another one. But people were talking about, oh yeah, you know, once you've got too many modules and you get weird behavior, you're never going to get to that point because you're never going to have that many modules. Well, okay, if you do, then buy another power supply. It doesn't have to be difficult or mysterious. Just get one off the shelf. Now, the 4MS row power. I uh, remember this. 4MS. So, 4MS. So, Behringer haven't done a power supply yet. Row 40, I think it is. That, I think, was about 130 quid. That just seems nuts, right? Because it's just the power supply. It's just this little 4 HP module. And you're already in, in the bucket, in the, I don't know if that's an expression, uh, for 200 quid. And that's just case and power supply. And I haven't bought a patch cable. I've just got this bit. OK, I'll try to keep the reality to a minimum, perhaps. So the next decision is whether you go for bus boards or flying cables. These are flying bus cables. Uh, all the proper uh, modular heads hate these. Uh, I like them. 
They hate them because they're noisy. But whoever does this, I don't know. So you can get you can get lovely PCB bus boards that go in the back that you plug stuff in. That's fine. Uh, but and these are just flying cables, and you plug them into that also. That's fine. These don't cost a whole lot. So um, go with either. So just to, to pull that together, you need to buy a case and power supply. Don't be scared. You could get something pre-built like the Arturia Rack Brute, for instance. And there you've got 6U, you've got, I think, two lots of 84 HP. Go for that. It's, a, it's done. Buy something off the shelf. Buy a lovely briefcase thing from Erica Synths with a power supply built in. You could buy a single skiff from Bafaco with a power supply built in. Uh, you could buy the Behringer, one of these, and a row power power supply, put those together, and you're sorted. You have to do that first, otherwise you're not going to get anywhere. You can, of course, build your own case, build your own power supply. You can build a case out of cardboard. That's okay. I built one that just had two cardboard sides and uh, some rails that I bought, um, which worked, and everyone <laughs> Everyone was very scared for me because I was going to blow myself up with, with putting my fingers behind things. But I didn't. I'm still here. It worked. It's okay. So you can be as expensive and extravagant and elegant and boutique-y with it as you like. Oh, it can be rough and ready and simple. So just you just have to make that leap. You have to. There's no way to do it. You can, of course, bypass all of this and buy a completely made-up modular system from a manufacturer. But then where the f is the fun? Where is the fun in that? So that then brings us to actually putting this thing together. I had no plan for this. I just thought we'd just see how that went. Now, the first thing is that what we're going to do together is just build a little synth voice. Uh, depending on how much time we have, and then plug it together and see if it makes some noise. Uh, the idea, hopefully, will be a, it'll, a couple of things will come out of it. First of all, it will seem really disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> because we'll be totaling this up as we go, possibly, and you'll realize that you've, you could have bought four or five MS-101s by now, and we would have been having a lovely sort of acid rave party. <laughs> Whereas we've spent all the same sort of money and we're getting a beep. <laughs> but it's, it's what that beep represents. It represents this, <laughs> this, this freedom of expression and creativity which is going to emerge any moment now. That's the thing. So um, uh, I just want to mention in terms of DIY, this was a, a module I put together myself from a kit. Kits are wonderful. I'd hardly recommend uh, giving that a go, buy a 20 quid soldering iron, it doesn't have to be posh, you don't have to have safety, yes, you should have safety goggles, um, you don't ha need extractor fans, you know, any of the stuff that people say you need, you just need a soldering iron and uh, a, a rainy afternoon, and you can start putting these things together. Um, as, you know, provided that they work, you do it carefully, and if they work, brilliant. If they don't work at the end of the day, I have no idea how to fix it. But I've been lucky so far, and they've worked. So I built this one. It's great. It's from Bafaco. It's called the Even VCO. Does anybody want to look that up and shout us out a price at some point? From Bafaco, the Even VCO. If that doesn't happen, I'll just ignore it and continue. But if anybody wants to, that'd be super. So this is an oscillator. All it does is generates waveforms. It generates a, a sine wave, a triangle wave, a square wave, and an even wave, which is a mysterious combination of waves within itself. So in terms of actual DIY, when it comes to your case, power supply, and modules, the only thing you actually need to be able to do is plug this cable in. That's it. That's as complicated as it gets. It looks complicated. looks, you know, I shouldn't probably be touching all this stuff. But it's not. You've got your bus cables. I'm not plugged in. That's always a good thing to check. And all I'm literally going to do is plug this cable in. So um, I'll do that. I'll have to just get on with do that. Ta-da! Okay, we, we're in. We're in. Okay. So that's all it needs. So with, uh, let's see. Well, okay, I'll plug it in, right? Um, I do already have a, an output module plugged in over here. You don't need an output module when you start. I have this so that it doesn't kill the sound in here. So um, that's why that's existing. It's a lovely thing to have, and you, will and you will get to the point where you know you need that. 
But initially, you can just plug the output of your oscillator into a speaker, you know, uh, observing the usual kind of, I'm going to blow this to bits, kind of uh, um, precautions. That's the word I'm after. So, yeah, I'm going to plug that in there, plug that in there. So this is a patch cable, and I have patched it. I've patched it from here to here. Turn it on. There's no smoke. I'm going to turn that up. And there we have a sine wave. There you go. It's an oscillator. It's oscillating. It's creating a sine wave. Uh, yeah. Yeah. How much are we in? 109 quid. Okay. Thank you. So let's see. Uh, even VCO. 109. <coughs> so with the even VCO, it doesn't have um, a swept pitch. It has a octave. Like so. And then it has a bit of a fine tune in between. So that's all I can do. So uh, it has different outputs. So there's the square wave, and there is pulse width modulation. So it's already getting interesting. Um, whatever that is, sawtooth and triangle, which sounds a bit like the sign. Yeah, but a little bit. And then there's this their own waveform, which is a combination of a couple. Great, we can go home. So what, uh, what would be next then? If we're thinking about this as a synthesizer voice, a synth voice, a simple voice, what would be the next thing that we need? Anybody? Filter? Filter. OK, so you're, you're a fun crowd then. You want to go for filtering rather than actually controlling the volume of the thing. OK, fine, let's do that. So I have here a, a Joe filter. This is an outrageous clone of a Roland filter, which is fabulous. I love this filter. I didn't really understand the, the falling in love with bits of technology thing that people would talk about. I do. I do now. It's a lovely filter. <laughs> right, so uh, let's turn it off. Uh, now, these are expensive as well. Core blimey. So uh, Joe filled from System 80. If somebody wants to look that up. Oh, come on, fingers. There we go. So that's now plugged in, my DIY skills. I didn't build this one. I bought it uh, ready-made. not going to worry about screwing them in, or am I? Because I'm going to might... Let me put... A oh, no, sorry. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Right, so let's choose another random cable. Because what I'm going to have to do now, I'm going to have to patch the filter into the signal path, right, because at the moment we've been dealing with audio, yeah? That's all we're dealing with. It's just sound coming out of here down this cable. So the sound is now going to go into the input on the filter. And then the output of the filter is going to go into my thing that I hear things through. OK, so that's a filter. We like filters. We understand filters, we think, because it makes that sort of sound. So that's great. The, the thing with filtering is that you need an interesting signal to filter in the first place. Um, so I'm using the even output from the oscillator. That gives me something to filter. If I was using a sine wave, there wouldn't be any harmonics to remove, if that makes sense, and it would be a very dull sound. So you need an interesting waveform to get something interesting with a filter. It's got lots of resonance you can use. Now, this is modular, right? It's a machine. We're thinking about it in terms of machines, working with machines. So I don't want to be doing this by hand all the time. 
I want to start getting things modulated. I mean, we're not playing a tune yet. We'll play a tune in a minute, maybe. But so far, I've got a, an oscillator that I can change the pitch of, and I've got a filter. It's feeling fairly synthy, I think. But do I want to modulate the filter first, or do I want to create a tune first? Any preference? LFO, somebody says. OK. Modulation, then. Let's jump straight to that. What's time? How time are we doing? We're all right. It's half an hour. Good. Right. Good. So uh, um, uh, LFO, low frequency oscillator. It's just an oscillator. It's just like the Bifaco, but it's running at a much lower speed. And so because it's running at a lower speed, we get a nice slow type of waveform, or a square wave but it's running slowly so that we can hear its effect and its change on parameters over time. Um, if I sped the LFO up, it would become an oscillator as opposed to a low-frequency oscillator. Um, so that's how they're related. It's the same thing. It's just stuff moving. I imagine in here there's something spinning around. I, I don't actually know. So I will, uh, I will turn that off. I will plug this in. Where shall I put it? Now, with modulo, it doesn't matter where you put things. It's entirely up to you how the signal flow is represented visually. You could have things all over the place. I tend to have things all over the place. Um, or you can do it in a nice ordered line that makes sense in the way things travel. It doesn't matter because it's modular. It doesn't matter. That's the great thing. None of it matters. So, or by which I mean there's no right way. There's no right way. There's lots of people will tell you there's right ways. I hear a lot about right ways. OK, so it's got lights on, which is great. This is a Batumi uh, from a company called, I think it's called Chaos, but I've never quite worked it out. So it's XAOC, but they pronounce it differently. That I never quite understand. But anyway, so it's got four LFOs in it. They can be sine waves, they can be square waves, or they can be random waves. And these. Um, uh, what do we call these? Sliders. These sliders. Is this up on the thing? It is. Look. Oh, that's brilliant. Okay. Sorry. I don't know why it's me. These sliders, right? They control how fast things go. So let's take the output of sine wave. We're going to plug it into the control voltage input. So what we're doing is we're sending this sine wave to one of these knobs. This knob in particular, the frequency knob. So if I turn this back up. We can now hear that the filter is moving all by itself. If I turn up the speed a little bit, it will become more obvious. So that's my low frequency oscillation controlling this knob. I mean, one thing that doesn't happen in Eurorack is that the knobs don't physically move. I've always thought that's a bit of a flaw in the whole thing. Because, you know, on a software synth, the knobs move. You know, you, you, you put a modulation to something else and they start going. That's brilliant. I respond well to that kind of visual stimulus. It doesn't seem to work in here. I'm sure there must be a way it could be done. But essentially, this now is controlling this knob. Although it's not controlling this knob, it's controlling the, the parameter that that knob is controlling. <laughs> See, there's levels to your rack where understanding things becomes, it's, it becomes a bigger thing. There's more levels of understanding. And then there's more levels of understanding. I like to stay at the top of all of that. I just ride above it and stay with the simple explanations. So I like talking about things that are turning around inside things, hamsters or uh, people moving things. That things I, those are the sort of things I understand. So I have certain controls I can apply to this, this low frequency oscillation. I can decide how much of that is being pumped at this knob with this other knob here. So I can make it go on a huge sweep, or I can make it go on quite a small one. 
like that. I could at the same time take another output of this um, low frequency oscillator, I'll take a random output and I'll plug that into CV number two which controls the resonance. Oh, it kills the resonance, I wasn't. So the random output of the Batumi is giving me a stepped random voltage output. Um, so rather than a nice smooth wave, it's stepping up and down randomly all over the place, and that is now affecting the resonance. That's a uh, droid mode. And because this is control voltage, I can swap those around. I don't have to have those doing that. I can have that one doing that. And that one doing that. Oh, I can have that one doing the pitch. And I can have that one doing the pulse width. If I had that plugged into there. So now I've got, I'm back to the situation where nothing's controlling the filter again. Hang on. So you need yet another patch cable. And I can take another thing back. Sine wave back into there. Oh! Oh, it's like a square wave this time. Put that into the resonance. So yeah, I've just got craziness. And that is the essence of modular synthesis, is that I can take a plan, a plan for moving a filter, and I can just start plugging it into other things, and that plan has now changed, and now I'm affecting a pitch, and I'm affecting pulse width modulation, and I'm then doing the filter again. So it just, it sort of throws up <laughs> out of itself somehow, these ideas and these concepts that just keep moving. So you start from a very simple idea, and if it was a synthesizer, you would only have one or two options. Whereas with this, just with three modules, I've got stuff going all over the place. Without any intention, without any plan, without, oh, I know, I'm going to do this because that's the right thing to do musically. No, I'm just going to stuff this in here and see what happens. And I could use something like a mixer, little mixer module to mix bits and pieces together to send combined waveforms to something. So rather than the the filter moving like that, it could move like that and then and then like that. And you could create an interesting um, movement or combination of control voltages. Right. Next I think I'm going to stick in a VCA. So VCA, what's a VCA? VCA, where's a VCA? Oh, here we go. Uh, VCA, voltage controlled amplifier. The important thing is the voltage controlled bit. Now these are vital. People, you will hear people say you need lots of these. You can never have enough VCAs, they say. I think you can, because, you know, we're not idiots. But you c having a few of these is helpful because it, it creates space between all of your waveforms and gives you the opportunity to do different things with them, either with control voltage or with audio. Yes, so let me put this in. This needs to go, I mean, traditionally speaking, it would go after the filter, yeah? Looking for confirmation. Okay, so I'm gonna make a little bit of room. So we have a, uh, a veils from Mutable Instruments. That's got itself snagged. Uh, it's a four, uh, channel VCA, so it's got four VCAs inside, very simply. So I'm going to decomplex my uh, my patch here. I'm going out of there into my filter. I'm now going to go out of my filter 
into my VCA. Good. Now, this VCA is um, normalized down itself. Now, normalized just means that there are cables connected internally, behind the scenes, so that unless I plug something in the output here, then this will flow down to the next one, to the next one, to the next one. So it can act as a little mixer. And that is very handy. So I can take a single output at the bottom, plug that into my bit over here, and I'll be able to hear everything that goes into this VCA out of this single cable. Now, that's useful. So what I can do is I can take the other outputs from the Bifaco and stick those in. So I can take a sine output, put that into the next channel, take the sawtooth to the next one, take the square wave into the last one, down, down, on. Okay, I'll turn those down for the minute. So there's our, there's our filtered one. Then we can bring in whatever it was I plugged in next, sine wave. Bit of sawtooth, bit of square wave. Now, if I was clever enough to bring a scope with me, we could look at it and all stroke our chins and go, mm. but now we're just going to have to use our ears, damn it, and, uh, and go, okay, that's a more interesting waveform than what I had originally. So one of these, part of this I'm filtering, the rest of it's not, that's just droning. That's interesting. So I can take my Batumi again, run the pulse width modulation, and that's now running just that one channel, which is down here. That I can also modulate. And there's moments like this, you just stand back from the machine and go, oh, it was worth every penny. But yeah, that's great. So just I'm using a single oscillator. I've now got four different waveforms mixing through my system. One of them's being filtered, another one's being pulse width modulated, which means it's a square wave, which is having its squareness pushed around. And it's generating this rather nice, relatively complex drone, just from a few quid and a, and a couple of modules. Yeah, so that's why something like a quad VCA is interesting. I mean, purely at the moment, it's dealing with audio. It's only dealing with audio. Nothing else exciting is going on, but already it's, it's opened up my single oscillator into becoming a synthesizer where you can mix waveforms. So I'm going to stuff in two things now, I think. Uh, we'll see. All right. So we're going to make it play a tune. I'm going to make it play a tune with a Turing machine. Turing machine is a fabulously random module. I don't mean, oh, it's a bit random. I mean, it creates random voltages uh, in a brilliant way that allows you to create tunes. So I'm going to stick that in. Take the output of the Turing machine, plug that into the voltage input, voltage per octave input, rather. Is that me? Nice, okay, right. So, um, to control pitch on an oscillator, we have a standard in Eurac called voltage per octave. So for every volt, you go up an octave. It's that simple, really. Um, but there's no actual definition of what a pitch is, because pitch isn't held within a sequencer. 
in your, if you're familiar with doors and software, the pitch is defined by your piano roll, by your door. It tells you what pitch everything is. Within modular, there is no pitch. You mustn't think that there's a pitch. There's no pitch. Any pitches you happen to meet along the way are just sort of figments of a deranged imagination. And the pitch itself comes only through the interaction with the oscillator. So in order to get the Turing machine to work, it needs to have a clock. So I'm going to give it a clock from, you can buy clock modules that generate a pulse and that can run all sorts of things in your system. You can also use an LFO to do that. So I'm going to use the Pachumi, a square wave into the clock. And that's going to start, hopefully, moving my Turing machine. Like so. So there's our tune. It's not very tuneful, but it's a tune nonetheless. Now, we can improve upon that by using uh, another module called a quantizer. Now, this quantizing is, is a confused term because quantizing generally refers to timing, getting timing right in your door, in your software. You quantize things to a beat. Quantizing in modular is about pitch, or rather, it's about voltage. Nothing to do with pitch. Pitch doesn't exist. It's to do with voltage. It's going to um, quantize the voltage to a set voltage, which we then pretend is pitch. <laughs> so I'm off. Yeah, good. Right. Plug that in there. So rather than taking my Turing machine to the oscillator, I'm going to plug it into my quantizer. And I'm going to take, sorry, I didn't turn the sound down. I'm going to take the output of that to there. And now I can define a couple of notes. And now it's playing recognizable notes. The quantizer itself has a mini keyboard on it. They don't always have that. This particular one, the Microscale from IntelliGel does. And I can add a few notes, and then it can start playing them. On the Turing machine, once I found a, uh, a tune I like, I can turn the knob to one side and it will continue to loop that. Rather than randomizing, it will now capture that loop so we hear the same thing over and over again. I don't know, what's a key? Because the reason I say that is because this is my oscillator, right? So what's it playing now? What's it playing now? What's it playing now? I don't know, I'm just tuning it to whatever I fancy. But the tune, the, rather the voltages coming from this, maintain, are the same. And what the voltage does is it changes the pitch relative to what the pitch currently is. So I set the pitch on the oscillator, and then it changes it relative to that. So this isn't saying play a C. This is saying play 0.2 volts more than what you currently are. So the pitch is always set in the oscillator. That's why you see people trying to tune oscillators because you need to get them to all hang together in the same place so that you can make something musically helpful. So about 1200, 1300 quid. That's a Korg Prologue. <laughs> so, uh, or a grandmother, isn't it? Or something. So, well, there you go. You know, I mean, actually, that's not too bad. It wasn't too grand, was it? It might have been had we started finishing off with these other bits and pieces. So, the c all I'm trying to get across is that cost is a factor. Um, but it's not a, it's not a splurgy kind of, addiction. It's a occasional thing. You have, you know, a new module every Tuesday, but you know, or every <laughs> or every couple of months, you know, depending on, on, on your own habit. So it it has this wonderful way of infecting your uh, your musical life because it doesn't say oh, oh let's say it's a hundred quid. Yeah, yeah, that's all right, hundred quid. No, I don't mind, you know. 
that'll be fine. You're not buying a prologue every week. You're, you're buying little bits and pieces and it builds up and you, you play with what you have. And you start running into things that you think, oh, well, if only I could do that, that would make that thing interesting. And so you research that and then, I mean, it's, it's a whole, it's like, being in a, it's like being in a little club where you start researching things and trying things out and having a look at that. And then eventually you buy the right thing and plug that in and that makes you happy for a little while and then you get <laughs> discontented again and, and so it goes. But, you know, there is, a, there is a real price involved in it, but it's also something which happens over time, I think. And that's, I, I, I would always advise against buying a pre-built system because you will never understand how that all comes together and how it works. Whereas going through, starting with a couple of things, with a case that's too big, and you know, buy a case that's too big, that's fine, that's the future you're thinking of, and a couple of modules, you can explore that while you're saving up for the next one. And then something else comes in and it changes everything. And then something else comes along and that changes everything again. There's also a really healthy second-hand market. So if you find something you're just not getting on with, um, you can punt that out and get a chunk of your money back and put that into something else. Or you can go the DIY route where you're building modules rather than pre-built and that again is cheaper. So there are ways of getting around this potentially enormous price. Yeah, is that, is that all right? Is that enough? We'll go with that. Thank you.